Welcome to another episode of the brand called You. Today it is indeed my privilege to have Mr. Pradeep Bajal with me. Mr. Bajal, welcome to the show. Thank you. Mr. Bajal is uh, a very senior bureaucrat. He was the former chairman of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. But more importantly for my show, he is an author. He's written three books on disinvestment, telecom reforms in India, and the subject of our topic in this episode and the following two episodes, which is containing the China onslaught. Mr. Bajal is an expert on China. He's done a lot of research on China. So Mr. Bajal, let's come straight to the point. Talk to me about how did China grow from 180 to the, 18, to the 1800s? How was the Indian economy compared to the Chinese economy? And what was really going on in those days? And I am very surprised that I don't have data before 180, so I'm, I'm blocking <laughs> myself at 180. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm surprised that from 180 to about 1900 AD, right. China and India uh, traced each other. Right. They were the same. They went up uh, very sharply till about 1830. And then the uh, Industrial Revolution started. They didn't touch China or India because the technologies were kept by US or England. Mm -hmm. And uh, then suddenly after 1830, USA and England and the West shut up. Mm -hmm. And India and China, which were 50% per of the world's GDP, became 5% of the world's GDP. Okay. England from 1% became 6 and USA from 6% became 25%. Mm -hmm. so, so there was uh, an enormous growth in the West mm -hmm. and uh, we went down. Both of us went down together. Correct. In 1950, suddenly, the whole thing reversed. Mm -hmm. I'll come to that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you talk about, you know, what happened after 1830 and then you said that when the, the two countries fell down to just 5% between 1830 and 1970, what was so momentous that happened in mid 1900s that changed China around completely. I was also very surprised. I never thought that any process can happen in this dramatic manner. Mm -hmm. When I started reading the books, I realized that a miracle happened. Mm -hmm. And what was the miracle? 1951. Both the countries became independent, China and India. Correct. Two, the colonial loot start in both the countries. Mm -hmm. And most important, you know, as I told you, today the function, uh, the, the, the GDP growth is dependent on technologies. Mm -hmm. From 1830 to 1950, technologies helped the West. Correct. Suddenly, technologies uh, invented in the West mm -hmm. started, help, started helping India and China. And that was the most remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. They started helping India and China because, number one, the technologies were on uh, the wire or the wireless. Mm -hmm. So the world was interconnected. The world had to be interconnected. Otherwise, the technologies were of no use to the West. So mm -hmm. they got connected. And once we got connected, we also started gaining from these technologies. Mm -hmm. In China, something more happened. The USA, very funnily, and for very strange reasons, decided to partner China. Nixon decided to partner China. Mm -hmm. I thought when I started studying that this was a very silly decision. Mm -hmm. and now the entire world says that this, is, uh, this was a very silly, silly decision. So India and China used these technologies, IT and mobile, to suddenly start growing. Mm -hmm. And they grew to some size. Correct. So, sir, tell me, given all the research that you have done over the years, what prompted Nixon to choose China over India. I mean, after all, we were similar countries, similar size economies. We were a democracy. Yes, and yet, that is also very interesting. That is also very interesting. That how the petty egos hmm. of big leaders impact the world. Okay. Now, what were the petty egos of the big leaders? Hmm. Nixon had tried to help Pakistan in the Bangladesh war. Right. And Mrs. Gandhi had made a, a zero out of him by calling the Russian ships also in the Bay of Bengal mm -hmm. when he had sent the 7th Fleet. Mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, US 
and Nixon had to retreat. Now, Mao was a great leader and he was a visionary. He realized that after 1971 Bangladesh war, whatever happens, USA will not be sympathetic to India. Now, Mao had tried all kinds of tricks. He had tried the red card, he had tried the all kinds of new deals, mm -hmm. communist deals, mm -hmm. Marxist philosophy. Right. And they failed, and they failed totally. To the extent that after the 60s, China had a huge famine. Mm -hmm. And even the red card, etc. failed. And the country went into total chaos. When this happened, Mao had the vision that communism will not work. The, the traditional communism systems will not work. And he had the vision that I have to go to the best country. And who's the best country? United States with the maximum GDP. So he said, whatever may be our philosophy, is, I will go to US. However, he knew that USA will not touch him. So he kept waiting. He started talking to USA since 1965, but he waited till the Bangladesh war and then realized <clears throat> that now is the time to hit. So he had the famous meeting in uh, Beijing in 1972. Look at the timing. When the meeting happened, you know, I was very lucky when I started writing the book. USA had declassified the, those meeting documents. So I read all the documents and I was surprised. And, and, and you can only uh, get to understand the events when you go deep into the events. When I read the event, I found that on some mention of Indira Gandhi, Nixon said that she is a witch. Mm -hmm. Some people say she, they, he said she is a bitch. And Chow and Lai started laughing very loudly. Mm -hmm. Now, why does a world leader laugh in a meeting like this? Right. So he started laughing very loudly. Obviously, mm -hmm. Chow knew that Mao's gamble has been successful. Right. And now there is no way that uh, Nixon is going to partner with Indira Gandhi. Mm. So therefore, he thought, now I have won. At that time, the, the Americans were looking at two countries. Mm. Naturally, India and China with a huge, huge, huge market numbers. And they were thinking, some people were saying, democracy, partner with India, put them in the American bloc. Mm. Of course, they knew that India was more difficult, but they were considering, and they were considering China. But China, they were scared. They didn't want to touch. And Mao knew here is the opportunity and he encashed it. Very interesting. So what you're saying really is that the ego of Nixon and Indira Gandhi is what took America away from India to China. And not ego of Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi had no choice when, <laughs> when we were being uh, beaten into pulp. Mm -hmm. by Bangladesh, by sending lakhs and lakhs of people to India, mm -hmm. they would have finished the Indian economy. She had no choice and she did a very intelligent thing. Okay. But Mao realized that this is my opportunity. You also mentioned, sir, that uh, you know one of the other reasons was that Nixon wanted to use China to contain Russia. Yes, yes. You see, Mao always had one, two, three strategies for achieving an end. And the second strategy that he was using was that he was giving hints to the United States that I can deal with Russia, I can finish Russia if I become big. Hmm. And therefore, uh, Nixon also bought that. Hmm. I'm very surprised such a big country bought this bogus deal. Hmm. Why bogus? Because you would recall hmm. that USA had adopted another, another strategy of finishing Russia. And how do I finish Russia? I convinced the Russian leaders, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, that democracy is a very beautiful thing. Right. And we will have democracy in Russia. And you recall, uh, both Yeltsin and Gorbachev used to climb on tanks. I remember I used to deal with Russia and I used to be on the Red Square very often, and I've seen those tanks mm. with Yeltsin uh, going on uh, Red Square. So, 
these people had decided that we will bring in democracy. Mm. It is surprising that Americans didn't realize that this had happened, but Mao realized. As a matter of fact, not Mao, later Deng. Mm. Deng said that Gorbachev was an idiot, mm. that he destroyed a very powerful Russian empire, which, consider, uh, which consisted of more than half of Europe also. Now, now when the, the, the Americans started helping the Russians, they said, you must bring democracy, and they brought democracy. Once they brought democracy, what happened was that Russia became uncontrollable. Everyone, there were, there, there were lots of suppressed uh, spirits in them, and they started feeling all the Eastern Europe and all the, all the provinces of uh, Russia who started feeling that we must get rid of this uh, villain, Moscow. And because they started feeling, the country started breaking up. Correct. And it broke up. Correct. So when Americans took the same philosophy to China, China also started breaking up. Because that also has very diverse uh, community within the country. Correct. So Deng, who became the main leader much later, he went to the Americans and said, look, I don't want to break up like Russia did, so give me some time. Mm. We will grow China and then we will become democracy. In fact, you know, I've, I've, I've traveled quite a bit in both China and Russia in those days. And in Russia, the two terms, glasnost and perestroika, was, were the buzzwords in Gorbachev's time. And I debated and the Russians said that political liberalization must come before economic. And the Chinese used to say economic must come before political. Yes, precisely. Thinking. Precisely. And that is how the Chinese were very bright and they're bright even today. And that has created all the problems. So whenever you have an excess of any policy, you get into trouble. So moving on, you know, from Mao, there were people in between, but you know, let's come to Deng Xiaoping. What was the role that he played in liberalization uh, and opening up of China? And then do talk to me a little bit about Tiananmen Square. Okay, okay. Let me first come to Deng. Deng is a very interesting story, frightfully interesting story. He was recognized as a reformer. Hmm. So when the Americans went to China, they were talking to Deng most of the time. But then the Chinese population very scared of uh, America. And they found that the Chinese were talking to the Americans. Mm. So they almost revolted. All these uh, red guards and all these uh, people went and attacked them. Mm -hmm. At this point of time, like all leaders in the world, Mao had to find a scapegoat. And who was the scapegoat? The scapegoat was Deng. So Deng was put into prison. Okay. When Deng was put into prison, his family was put into prison. He was on forced labor mm. and uh, he was attacked. His son, I think one of his brothers was killed. His son is, a, is, is an invalid, invalid even today. Mm -hmm. So he was in jail for two years. Deng. Now, when Deng was in jail, nothing happened after the 1972 meeting. In 1976, Mao died. Okay. And you recall the, 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 the gang of four took over. Oh, yeah. And when the gang of four took over, uh, China started disintegrating. Correct. The Chinese generals mm. thought that how will we save China? Mm. And let me add one more thing. Uh, China is basically run by a politician. Correct. And Politburo has everyone, they have political leaders, they have administrators, they have technocrats, and they have the army. So the army generals are also there. Mm. So in the Politburo, Ch uh, Chinese general said, we must control the country. So the generals put Deng as president. 1978, the elections took place, and Deng was put as president. He almost walked... The army, is it? Army, yes. Army generals, yes. Because they said, this is a very strong fellow. Doesn't matter, he had started reform some time back and he was in prison, doesn't matter. So he almost walked from the prison to the president's house. So yes. that's how Deng came. When Deng came in 1978, the Chinese were fed up of the chaos 
clearly the chaos during uh, the the gang of four and once then came into the president's house he knew that he didn't have much time you would recall that even till yesterday in china you had a 10 year term of the chief executive yes so he knew he had a 10 year term mm. and uh, so he started uh, working very fast he went to the americans uh, and he was all powerful and he was a very aggressive powerful man right. he went to japan his old enemy he went to us in japan there are photographs that uh, deng is going into a bullet train along with the japanese president mm. and he started uh, reforms mm. but he told americans no democracy my chinese communist party will continue because we don't control china china is controlled by members of the communist party in each village correct so those fellows will remain and gradually we will get rid of them and we will bring in democracy hmm. those guys came the communist guy and the communism continued hmm. but he said <clears throat> we will give up communism very fast first let us develop like you had said that we first have economic growth then dem- democracy so when they were not doing anything americans got worried hmm. and americans said that ye to hamara bewakuf bana raha hai so they uh, told the their intelligence agency cia to start working on dynamic freedom agitation hmm. muslonian forces had already come in people had become richer and richer people said we want more freedom so the the movement for movement for more freedom started and tiananmen agitation started so tell me a little bit about the tiananmen agitation and yes, tiananmen agitation is very Because interesting you have mentioned that you know the, the official figures that came was only 200 people died yeah, yeah. all of us all of us remember that when tiananmen happened the news items that came out were ki 200 log mar gaye aaj but actually 20 30000 people had died no one knows the number and the chinese army got to know the 30000 chinese ko maar diya to they said ye 30000 chinese ko maar diya tiananmen hmm. so the army almost started revolt hmm. deng became unpopular hmm. and deng had to be eased out so deng was eased out and someone else came Uh, this term was also over. then deng was almost put into prison mm. there were also talks that we will execute him mm. now imagine a person who had changed china from a zero to a hero mm. the the chinese pilot bureau and that is the beauty of the chinese pilot bureau there are no individuals right. it's, a, it's a it's a group of people of all kinds mm. when this happened then got very worried because then was a highly intelligent man mm. and he got in touch with bush by this time bush was the bush senior was the leader mm. he would say me <clears throat> bush wrote a written letter and i am i'm repeating that word written letter mm. to then that you are a wonderful man i have sympathy with what happened in tiananmen square mm. and i will not support you openly but i will support but i have sympathy with you okay. so deng kept this letter with him and when these uh, motions came to punish him in bullet bureau he produced that letter i see now i don't understand bush said that i will not openly support you mm. then what was the need of writing a letter it's a letter which i have put in my book mm. it's a very touching letter that you are such a wonderful person so <clears throat> when that letter came our friend uh, deng got saved and i think the name of the new president was wang uh, who had come in who was a very decent man who was a uh, more thing i think that's right that's right he was a very decent man he was a quiet man mm. so when he came in as the leader there were number of tasks which were in, unfinished because this 10 year rule Deng retired in 1987. Correct. When Deng retired in 1987, and at that time this Tiananmen agitation started, 
the Politburo thought we will not be able to control the Tiananmen agitation, which we must. Yeah. So, surprisingly, Deng became the defense minister, mm. the equivalent of defense minister. Now, imagine a system where 10 years the president. president became a defense minister. Mm. When he became the defense minister, he knew that he had to crush the Tiananmen uh, mm. revolution. Now, he knew that the Americans will not support. Mm. So, therefore, he worked quietly, worked with Bush, etc. And I think he got support from the Americans because Americans realized mm. that all these American companies which are working in China, their labor in the new liberal environment will become, uh, will not be so productive, will not be. Uh, uh, will not be a labor which will be totally disciplined. So I think, and mind you, this is not written in any book, in any literature. Correct. Uh, I think that Bush and Deng together planned the Tiananmen agitation. Wow, that is serious. And why did they, uh, why did they plan the revolution, uh, the, the, the agitation is very interesting. Mm. So, officially, Bush told CIA that uh, you control this, you encourage the agitation right. towards more democracy, towards more freedom. But this letter was predetermined mm. because they knew something will happen. And this letter was predetermined so that the American units and also the Chinese units uh, will keep producing to their maximum capacity. And that's how the letter was written. Now, there are many, many more instances mm -hmm. which show that this letter was uh, pre-planned. Mm -hmm. I have given four reasons that this letter was pre-planned. Number one, after the 19, after the Tiananmen uh, killings, USA encouraged China to become the member of the WTO. Right. Now, why did they encourage China to become member of the WTO? Because they had so much of surplus, which had to be sold somewhere. So, they encouraged them to uh, become a member of the WTO. And uh, what was WTO? They applied for WTO membership in 1998. And suddenly, they, they became WTO member in two years, 2001, with American support because America controls most of these uh, multilateral organizations. So they became a member in 2001. Okay. Russia also applied for WTO membership at the same time. Hmm. That is, at the same time, 1998. And they became a member in 2012. Now, please recall, in 1998, who had become more democratic? Who had more systems in place? Russia. But they became a member in 2012, and China became a member in 2001. And then, China, as a member of WTO, started misusing WTO. Mm. It started committing IPR thefts. It started sending huge numbers uh, to the United States, who were number one, getting admitted in colleges, who were becoming uh, labor, and who were committing thefts of technology. Mm. And surprisingly, even the United States agencies reported against uh, China, but no action was taken. Mm. So, for very strange reasons, China, uh, USA was helping China do all this. Right. And why were they doing this? Because they wanted more production out of China, where they also benefit out of that production. So, the international politics, after reading all this, mm. I have come to understand is very complex. And that is why a number of my friends, when I started writing this book, advised me that I should not write this book. Because uh, international politics is only for economists and uh, diplomats. It's not for IAS officers. We are very local. Okay. So, so, so this was one. Two, you know, 1987, Deng had retired. So first, 
the Americans kept Deng as defense minister. Two, they helped him. Three, they permitted all kinds of breaches. Then the China had a problem. China had grown in the uh, China had grown in the east and it had grown in the north. South was very underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. So they allowed Deng to control South. And, and China is a very strange system. The Prime Minister's powers are withdrawn, mm. particularly for the South. And you would recall that Deng did a long, long tour of the South in 1992. Yep. 1992. He had retired in 1987. And he brought in all the reforms in the South of China. Mm. And then China also started uh, shooting. Mm. Deng also did something very interesting. The initial monies which came from all over the world, that's in United States, he invested all those monies in infrastructure, not in production units. Right. And why did he do that? Number one, he knew under the guidance of United States that first you look after infrastructure, first you look after primary products, first you look after agriculture mm. and have a big base. This is unlike India because we never... Uh, invested heavily in uh, infrastructure. We never invested heavily in agriculture. You remember, mm -hmm. Atar Bihari Vajpayee uh, did the first major initiative on infrastructure much, much, much later. Right. But in the United, in China, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So what was the result? The result was that there was very poor growth in China in percentage terms. Now, Deng wanted the numbers to be very poor if you if you see the growth curves, till, till about, uh, uh, if you look at the growth curves of China, till about 2000, hmm. the growth curves are very poor. They are almost parallel to India. Yeah. And then it suddenly took off. And then uh, Goldman Sachs did a report. Goldman Sachs and all these consultants, big consultants, yeah. do reports on countries. And they did a report on countries. And they said, BRIC countries are going to explode, are going to grow very fast. What are they? Brazil, Russia, India, China, and later in 2005, South Africa. They said <coughs> that the BRICs they invested on infrastructure and they only invested in industries later. So the growth came after 2001. In 2001, Goldman Sachs said these are four countries that are developing normally. They never identified that China was growing fast. And in 2005, China started growing very fast and took over the world in 2015. Correct. And that was the first part of the Chinese growth story. Amazing. Mr. Bajal, thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing story you have given us uh, about the background of China and how it has grown. And for all our listeners and viewers, this is only part one. We'll be coming back to you for part two, where we'll be talking about the behavior of China in recent times. And that will be followed by a part three episode on how Mr. Bajil thinks we can tame China and what are what's in it for India. So thank you, Mr. Bajil, and I'll talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.